Welcome back to part two of the Genome Browser tutorial. In this section, I'll discuss navigating a gene, the track info page, uh, locating introns and exons, the default annotation tracks that are shown in the Genome Browser by default and their meaning, selecting, hiding, and viewing data tracks, and the gene detail page. If you remember from part one, we were focused on the superoxide dismutase transcript. And we got that by typing SOD1 in the search box and selecting it, clicking to go there. And you can see that we're already there. I want to discuss navigating a gene and understanding its exons and introns. So you can see we're looking at the SOD1 gene here. If we focus on the RefSeq genes track here, you can see that as I hover over each box, I get information about the exon or in intronic structure. This is exon 1 of 5, for example. I move to the right, it'll tell me that this is intron 1 of 4. Similarly, this is exon 2 of 5, exon 2 of, intron 2 of 4, exon 3 of 5, etc. Exon 4 of 5. You can see that there are five exons. Now you'll notice that there are full height and half height boxes. The half height boxes are untranslated regions, whereas the full height boxes are translated regions. The arrows show the direction of transcription. Now let's zoom in on one exon and learn more about it. Now if we're zoomed in on this particular exon, this is exon 2 of 5, and I want to understand where the other exons are, I can go to this double-headed arrow on the right, and it'll show me that the next exon is 3 of 5. If I go to the left, it'll show me that the previous exon is 1 of 5, and I can click that to move there now. Now we're looking at exon 1. In exon 1, you can see the structural difference between the two transcripts that are reported by the GenCode genes track versus the one transcript reported by the RefSeq genes track. Now I want to draw your attention to the GenCode uh, genes track. GenCode genes are like RefSeq genes, but they're annotated by UCSC, and they take more source information into account. And the colors here have meaning as well. So black means that the feature has a PDB entry, likely a crystal or NMR structure. Dark blue is that the transcript has been validated by RefSeq or SwissProt. Medium blue, other RefSeq transcripts support the transcript annotation, but they're not necessarily uh, reviewed by humans. And light blue means that non-RefSeq transcripts have been reported. So this is a way of giving you sort of confidence in um, the isoform that you're seeing. You can see that as I mentioned, there are two transcripts in the GenCode track for SOD1. One is black, which means it has a PDB entry, and the other is blue. The difference between them is that there is a truncation in exon 1. Okay, now I'd like to talk more about the other default annotation tracks that are on when you go to the browser for the first time. We've already talked about the GenCode and RefSeq transcripts, and I just want to talk about the track click-through page. This is a sort of best-kept secret that a lot of people don't know about, even if they're regular users. And that is that if you want more information about a particular track, you can actually left click on the left side of the screen and it'll take you through to a page that gives you more information about that annotation. It allows you to set some features of that track. You can turn on and off numbering in this case and do other things. And it'll give you more descriptions and some references uh, so you understand how the track was compiled, where the data came from, and you can link out to related databases and, and publications. So this is a useful feature to know if you want to understand better in a more depth any track that you're looking at. So I'll say submit to get back to the browser. Okay, now I want to talk about the OMIM allelic variance track. That's a track that's directly below the RefSeq genes track. OMIM stands for Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man. Uh, OMIM SNPs are SNPs that have a DB SNP ID, but are primarily related to genetic disorders, and so they're curated in a separate database. You can see that each one in this track has a number, and that they all fall within exon 1. Below that we have the human mRNAs track from GenBank. These are alignments of mRNAs reported to GenBank to the assembly. In this case, you'll see that the mRNA alignment matches the reported transcripts. I'm going to zoom out once now. Now I'd like to draw your attention to the track below mRNAs, which is the histone acetylation track from ENCODE. What's different about this track is that instead of displaying information as discrete bars or lines, you can see that the data are continuous here. Their height is, their, is the intensity. These data are 
continuously varying, and they are showing something about the acetylation of lysine on the H3 histone. Regions where there's more acetylation have a higher peak height. The data here are an overlay of data from seven different cell lines, and if you want to go in and understand what the color coding means, you can click on the left side of the track again, and it'll take you through to an information page, and now you can see the color schema for the different um, cell lines. You can turn them on and off individually. This information is useful because high levels of histone acetylation usually occur near regulatory elements, so it tells you where in the DNA regulation may be occurring. Directly below this track is another track that is related to regulation called DNA one hypersensitivity, and these are regions that are sensitive to DNA's activity, and again, these tend to fall in regulatory or promoter regions. Below the DNA one hypersensitivity track is a conservation track. It's a two-part track. The top part is a conservation score across 100 different vertebrate species as a result of a multiple alignment and then a computational calculation using a program called Philo P. These scores show blue when you have a conserved region and are red or negative when you have a fast uh, evolving region. You can see that the translated portion of exon 1 has a conserved region just within that exon, but then immediately outside of it you have fast evolving regions. And this makes sense that you would need the exons to be conserved. The bottom half of the track are conserved positions in select organisms. Again, you can see that the exons are highly conserved across organisms. And if I zoom out further, this becomes even more obvious. Now you can see that even in highly unrelated species like zebrafish, the exons of the SOD1 gene are conserved and of course, in a species like Rhesus monkey, which is much more closely related to us, the exons and introns are conserved. Directly below the conservation track is a track called Common SNPs. Common SNPs contains information about single nucleotide substitutions and indels. These are SNPs that come from the dbSNP database and are found in greater than 1% of samples by the minor allele frequency. They must map to only one position in the genome to be shown in this track. And they're shown as colored bars and the colors have meanings. So let me zoom in again on exon 1. Here you can see several SNPs from the dbSNP track, some of which are black and some of which are blue. The two that are blue means that they're SNPs occurring in a 5' prime or 3' prime untranslated region. Black uh, SNPs are intronic or intergenic. Green are coding SNPs, but they are synonymous and red or coding but non-synonymous or splice site variant. Finally, below the common SNPs track, you have a repeating elements track. A program called Repeat Masker scans the genome and, re and predicts where there are regions of low complexity or repeating DNA. These are shown as rectangles on the genome, and they're broken out by type. So you have short interspersed repeats, like ALU repeats, long interspersed repeats, and other types. You can see that within the SOD1 gene, there are different types of repeats. These are ALU family repeats, for example. Okay, now I'd like to talk about selecting, viewing, and hiding tracks. And there are a couple of ways to do this. The, the easiest way is to simply right-click on a track and select how you'd like to view it. You can hide it, and then you can view it in one of four modes. Dense condenses everything down to a single line and puts tick marks in this case. Squish uses multiple lines but tries to pack everything pretty closely together. Pack spreads things out further across many more lines. And finally, Full contains the most information. As you can see, now you have the numbers, the names, the substitution type, and the name of the disease that the variant is involved in in this case, a ALS. Each track can be manipulated in this way for viewing. You can also change the view from the display mode here in the track information page, or we can scroll down and select from here. Finally, I want to end by discussing the gene detail page. If you want to learn more about a particular gene, I'll zoom in here again on SOD1.
You can click on any of its exons and you'll get information about that specific gene. So here you can see the gene detail page for SOD1. You get a RefSeq ID, the reviewed status, a short description, and some other information, entree gene number, PubMed information, gene cards ID, and these all have links through to these databases. There's even a link through to a related uh, disease overview. Then there's a short summary, information about the alignment to the assembly, the position, the band, the genomic size, the strand. There are links to the sequence, and then some information about the RefSeq genes track again. So this is a very powerful tool because it pulls together into one place lots of different information about the gene that you're interested in. Okay, that's all for part two. Join me for part three where I'll discuss more tracks that are off by default but may be of interest to your research.